My name is Ahmad Afzal, I teach in religion. Today I want to talk about the path to a scientific consensus. Basically when I started learning about the science of climate change, I became uh, interested in the individuals, the people. That is to say the scientists themselves whose work uh, provides the sort of foundation on which modern climate science is based. And so I started learning about, about them and my uh, basic curiosity was I wanted to know how did this consensus develop? How did scientists arrive at this consensus that climate is being disturbed, that's because of um, global warming, which is due to carbon dioxide, which is due to fossil fuel burning. It takes, the way science works, institutionalized science, is that these kinds of things take years and decades before a consensus is reached. So I was interested in the process and also I wanted to know exactly when did that consensus develop. I wanted to know how long have we known this. Okay, so uh, wherever um, I look, the first person that everybody mentions is this guy right here, uh, Jean-Baptiste Joseph Fourier, uh, who was a French mathematician and physicist. If, if you're a math person, you may have heard of him. Uh, Fourier series, Fourier analysis are named after him. Um, he is often credited with the coming up with the greenhouse effect. Turns out that's not true. He did not come up with greenhouse effect. He did, however, um, uh, did you know perform lots of experiments and research on heat and the transmission of heat. He published this book back in 1822, the analytical theory of heat. He thought of himself as the as the Newton of heat. And um, he did not, he, he had, he calculated that if um, uh, there was, uh, well, he, he knew that there was something going on in the atmosphere, um, but he was not able to define it. Uh, he made a distinction between luminous heat and non-luminous heat. So he said, well, when the uh, sun, sun light and sun heat comes to earth, it penetrates the atmosphere, but it has trouble going back. He could not figure out why that was. But he identified the problem, which is, you know, in science as good as, um, almost as good as answering. Uh, so this fellow is John Tyndall, an Irish physicist. Um, he was a mountaineer. So therefore, because he was a mountaineer, he became interested in geology and in weather and climate. And so he wanted to know how is it, basically the issue was uh, ice ages. From there, he went into other things. This is John Tyndall giving a lecture. Um, and here is the equipment he used back in the 19th century to study the radiative property of gases. And he started studying this in January of 1859. And by May, he had basically figured out the greenhouse effect. He didn't call it greenhouse effect yet. Um, this is a famous paper he published back in 1861. Uh, on the absorption and radiation of heat by gases and vapors. It is amazing reading these primary sources from the 19th century. Uh, it's kind of painful too, but there are things that you learn about, about the evolution of science. Um, here's a, a little um, paragraph. Basically what he said was, he noted that oxygen, nitrogen, these gases uh, don't, are, are pretty much transparent to heat. But carbon dioxide, ozone, um, methane, they hold and radiate heat back. Uh, that was his major contribution. So the next person uh, in the story is Savante Arrhenius, a Swedish chemist. He was also interested in ice ages. And so he uh, basically did his own calculations. He was... Can we go forward? Hi there, Greg. Thank you. So this is a famous uh, paper um, uh, from 1896. He calculated that if you increase carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, temperature rises. And if you increase, uh, basically said, if you increase carbon dioxide, uh, uh, if you double it, the temperature would rise by four degrees Fahrenheit which turns out to be very close, although he had very primitive methods. Um, in uh, 1906, he published this book, um, translated into English as Worlds in the Making, and there 
he says a couple of interesting things. He knew that temp uh, temperatures would rise by the burning of uh, coal, and he knew that the amount of coal that we were burning was increasing every year. But he thought that that global warming would be a great thing. Uh, so he said, first of all, it will prevent a new ice age. He said, should we worry about another ice age? He said, no. The enormous co combustion of coal by our industrial establishments suffices to increase the percentage of carbon dioxide in the air to a percepti perceptible degree. That would be a good thing. This would uh, prevent an ice age. He also said that warming would be great because um, we may hope to enjoy ages with more equable and better climate, especially as regards the colder regions of the Earth. He lived in Sweden, so he thought global warming would be a great idea. Um, around the same time, the whole uh, evolution of climate science kind of suffered at that time, suffered a little setback because of this guy, um, Knut Angstrom, another uh, Swedish scientist, uh, who published a paper basically disproving uh, Arrhenius' insights. And um, he did some experiments, uh, Angstrom, and his experiments basically showed him that there was an overlap in the absorption bands of carbon dioxide and water vapor. So water vapor basically uh, absorbs the uh, all the heat, and if you add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, that would not cause any further increase in temperature. Um, for his part, Arrhenius published a rebuttal Nobody read the rebuttal, or at least they didn't pay attention to it. And um, basically what Angstrom has said became accepted, widely accepted, uh, for at least 30 years. Until this other fellow, Edward Olson Hubbard, figured out that actually um, Arrhenius was right, Angstrom was wrong, and that was in 1931 he published a paper saying um, yes, by increasing carbon dioxide, you will increase temperature. Unfortunately, um, Halbert published his paper in a journal called Physical Review, and climate scientists, people interested in weather, did not read that journal, so he was ignored as well. So the story kind of gets get stuck here. There is one interesting thing. Uh, Halbert did talk to the um, uh, popular press, apparently. This is the first mention I've been able to find of any mention of global warming, climate change, because of uh, carbon dioxide um, in the popular media, media. And this comes from uh, July 1932, issue of Modern Mechanics, 1932. Uh, and this was already being said there. OK. Next person here is uh, Guy Stewart, who was a British engineer interested in steam technology, but he as a hobby, he was interested in weather and climate. So uh, in his day, old folks were saying that winters are not as bad now as they used to be in their childhood. And so Stewart wanted to know, uh, uh, Calendar wanted to know if that was really true. So he collected as much uh, temperature data as he could. And he actually showed that he, in this particular paper from 1938, that yes, there is a small increase in temperature since 1880s. From 1880 to 1930, there was a small increase in temperature. Again, this was, uh, you know, scientists did pay attention to calendar, but there were a couple of things. First, um, calendar wanted to revive Arrhenius' theory that it's because of carbon dioxide, but the numbers that he had about carbon dioxide uh, other scientists didn't believe them. They thought this, these were not reliable. Uh, there was also this belief that carbon dioxide cannot possibly affect the climate because car most of carbon dioxide that we produce goes into the oceans. And somebody had to uh, pr prove that that's not true un until um, the next step could be taken. This is uh, Gilbert Plas, an American physicist, uh, he was recruited by the U.S. military to work uh, for the development of weapon systems in 1950s. But because he had access to all kinds of satellite data and computers, um, and his hobby, again, his personal interest was to figure out the effect of increasing carbon dioxide on the surface temperature. So he used all those resources uh, to figure that out. And by even early 50s, he had figured that much out. This particular uh, little 
news story is from Time magazine, May 1953, uh, titled Invisible Blanket. And this says, uh, John Hopkins physicist Gilbert Plas says, da da da, it's in, at its present rate of increase, the CO2 in the atmosphere will raise the Earth's average temperature 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit every 100 years. This is 1953. Here's another news story that I found. This is from Popular Mechanics, August 1953. Again, Gilbert Plas is, was interviewed and he says that basically he's saying that, carbon, that oceans are not going to save us. He says, if most of man's industrial growth were over a period of several thousand years, instead of being crowded within the last century, oceans would have absorbed most of the excess carbon dioxide. But this is not going to happen because we are burning uh, fossil fuels at a very high rate. So oceans uh, can't absorb all that uh, CO2. Uh, finally, he, uh, 1956, that's a groundbreaking paper by uh, Gilbert Plas, and his major contribution was that he finally s resolved the problem that Angstrom had created at the turn of the century by showing that the absorption bands of carbon dioxide and water vapor do not um, overlap at all, and he did that with a, with a very high degree of specificity. Um, and he also... Uh, basically uh, showed that oceans um, will absorb, uh, oceans, uh, the surface layers of oceans do absorb carbon dioxide, but um, that carbon dioxide eventually gets released. Actually, that the, the ocean part um, was not uh, PLAS's achievement, that was achievement of two other people, you're going to see them next, um, Roger Ravel and Hans Soos. Uh, they were working on this problem of how much carbon dioxide go in, goes into the atmosphere, how much into the oceans. And they published a paper next year, this is right after um, PLAS paper, uh, 1957. That's also a very landmark, uh, you know, groundbreaking paper. And that's what they said, they, uh, that surface layers of ocean absorb carbon dioxide, but this is not... Um, there's not enough time for all this, this carbon dioxide to sink into the bottom. So most of it is going to get um, released back into the atmosphere. The next problem, well, before I go to the next problem, here's one little quote. This is very widely quoted, so I thought I'll include it here. This is from Roger Ravel and Hans Suess's 1957 paper. Um, Thus, human beings are now carrying out a large-scale geophysical experiment. Within a few centuries, we are returning to the atmosphere and ocean the concentrated organic carbon stored in sedimentary rocks over hundreds of millions of years. So fossil fuels contain carbon that was stored uh, into deep down into Earth over 400 million years, and we are burning that within a century or two. So that is a very unprecedented thing. It's an experiment that we are doing un unwittingly, inadvertently, and that's going to result in some dramatic things. Uh, this is a story in Time magazine, uh, May 28, 1956. And as you can see, this one is titled One Big Greenhouse. And here, uh, Roger Ravel was interviewed, and he is saying, in 50 years or so, he's saying that in 1956. In 50 years or so, this process of adding carbon dioxide may have a violent effect on Earth's climate. Uh, he also knew about tipping points. He said uh, there will be a chain of secondary re effects, melting of the uh, Antarctica and uh, Greenland ice caps, flooding of uh, coastal regions. And, but then the report, uh, the report says, Dr. Ravel has not reached the stage of warning against the, this catastrophe, but he wants to keep studying and researching, which is what he did. And he recruited this next person, Charles David Keeling, uh, who was a postdoctoral fellow at that time, and Roger Ravel recruited him to, to basically measure carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That's the big hurdle at that point. There were no um, reliable records. And so Keeling um, did that part. Charles Keeling, well, Rod 
Okay. Roger Ravel wanted to, um, uh, he, wa he, he told Keeling that Keeling should go around the world and collect air samples. And Keeling said that that is just silly. What you need to do, you need to find one place, one clean place, and all the air of the world will come to you. And that's what he did. That's the Mauna Lao Observatory in Hawaii. And um, this is the flask that Keeling invented, and that was used to take air samples. And within two years, from nine, March of 1958, uh, starting there, he was able to say that wherever we have records that, go, that uh, are for more than one year, the carbon dioxide concentration the second year is always higher. What came out of Keeling's research is this famous curve known as the Keeling curve showing the rising carbon dioxide. Okay, I'm almost done. So this is early 60s. In early 1960s, so Roger Ravel, David Keeling, their associates, they had figured out almost everything that we needed to know. They had figured out the theory. By then, the theory was clear. The data was in, and it was obvious what's happening and what will happen. This is a report, um, report of the Environmental Pollution Panel of the President's Science Advisory Committee, prepared in uh, 1965. And this included, the people who wrote this report included a group of scientists who were led by Roger Ravel and David Keeling, uh, Richard David Keeling. And this is what it says. Carbon dioxide produced by this combustion is being injected into the atmosphere. About half of it remains there. About half of it remains there. So the problem of how much the oceans will, abs will absorb was re resolved by that time. And they knew that about half of what we release stays in the atmosphere. By the year 2000, the increase in atmospheric CO2 will be close to 25%. This may be sufficient to produce measurable and perhaps marked changes in climate and will almost certainly cause significant changes in the temperature and other properties of the stratosphere. So 1965, well, R Lyndon B. Johnson was president, and the White House, this report was produced for the president. So the White House knew that uh, this was happening and this was a problem. This is a message uh, that President Johnson sent to the Congress, February 1965. It contains this sentence. This generation has altered the composition of the atmosphere on a global scale through radioactive materials and a steady increase in carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. So basically, for all practical purposes, by 1965, uh, what I would call a consensus uh, was already reached. Now, there were lots of other things that took time. So I jump ahead in time and I go to the 1980s. This is James Hansen. So throughout 1970s and 80s, the question was not whether or not climate change will happen, um, anthropogenic climate change will, would happen, but the question was when, how soon, and what will be the consequences. Uh, the answer came from uh, the work of this particular person, James Hansen, uh, a NASA scientist. And here is Hansen uh, on June 23rd, 1988, giving a testimony uh, in front of the Congress, in front of the Senate Committee for Energy and Natural Resources. Now here's a quote from his, uh, from his oral comments. He said, the greenhouse effect has been detected and it is changing our climate now. So this was 1988. Um, basically, I just want you to, I want to tell the story, which I did. I also want, these, these folks, these people, I, I'm sure most of us have not heard of their names. Uh, these are not household names, but they should be. So I thought it's a good idea to know about these people. Uh, in, in the future years, during the rest of your life, if you're a college student, these people are going to be more important than Newton or Einstein or Galileo. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>